Welcome to Vitality Made Simple, the podcast that empowers you to live better, look better, and more fully enjoy the relationships in your life. It's all about relationships, and that just leads me perfectly into uh, our episode today with Mr. Joe Tippins. He is excellent at relationships. Um, you've probably heard about Joe. He had a, a miraculous rebound from... Um, cancer. He had insurmountable odds, but he's curious. Uh, and I'm dedicated to talking to curious people, people who are curious and brave and unafraid to, uh, take control of their health span. So, and, and it's so interesting, Joe, uh, when I heard about your story, I was excited for two major reasons, of course, to hear that somebody, uh, recovered from, incurable cancer or had more, more and more life. But number two, that your last name was Tippins, because in my patient family, uh, one of my most beloved families, uh, families that I respect and know are straight shooters were Terry and Donna Tippins. And in fact, your nephew, Sam built our home in 1998. We were his first, um, custom home when he got out of college at Oklahoma state. Um, but I knew that I could ask Terry to verify this. And, um, of course, when I said, Terry, is there any chance you're related to Joe Tippins? And he said, oh, Debbie, I know you've been hearing about Finn Benz at all. <laughs> Joe is the real deal. We thought we were going to lose him and it's the real deal. So that was probably, I'm guessing maybe 2018, Joe. Um, so well, 20, uh, fall of 2016. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The fall of 2016 was your, was your big diagnosis, but I think I probably started hearing about it maybe like, uh, 2017. Yeah, exactly. So, so Joe, tell us, start wherever you want to start listeners. Uh, everybody knows somebody who's had cancer. So you're going to want to share this podcast. It can help so many people. Um, thanks Joe. Welcome. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I'll try to do the reader's digest version because the, the, the long, the long version is a little bit too long to tell, but in the fall of 2016, I had accepted a, a partnership position with a firm in Zurich, Switzerland, and I got my Swiss green card. I had an apartment over there. I'd shipped all my clothes over there. And the, the Saturday before my Tuesday flight to literally move to Switzerland, I was feeling some congestion and, and a head congestion. And I thought I'd just go into a weekend dock in a box and, and get some pills or something to helped me on the flight the following Tuesday. The doctor in there was all by himself. And did, all the other people had gone home. He was It was closing time on a Saturday night. And uh, he did an x-ray and, uh, and then came back and asked me to come and look at the x-ray. And on the bottom uh, left lung, there was a kind of a swirl, a little light swirl. And he said, I, ne I need you to go do a CT scan and, and check this out. It, it looks bothersome to me. But I'm not, he said he wasn't an expert. And I said, ah, I'll just wait till I get to Switzerland. That doesn't look too bad. And the this guy probably saved my life. He he hounded me all day Sunday and all day Monday to go do a CT scan. And late Monday afternoon, my flight was early Tuesday morning. I did a CT scan. And sure enough, there was a tumor the size of my fist uh, in my lower left lobe. And... Um, uh, I did decide to postpone my trip to Switzerland, went and had a biopsy, and it was small cell lung cancer, which is very deadly. Mm -hmm. um, so I permanently canceled my move to Switzerland and moved to Switz to, to Houston, to MD Anderson, and, and started a journey there. And uh, it, it was, uh, there's two kinds of small cell lung cancer. It could be either localized in the lung or already metastasized. Uh, and mine was localized, so that was good news. Well, they started the whole regimen of chemo and radiation um, in the fall of 2016 at MD Anderson. And a lot of trials and tribulations along the way. They fried my esophagus into hard bacon. Nothing would go down or up. And so I made the crazy decision to live off of my fat stores and my muscle stores instead of getting a feeding tube. And I went eight weeks with no no nutrients, zero nutrients or water, and so I did I did IV IV injections twice a week to hydrate my body, and I went from two hundred and twenty pounds down to about one hundred and eight pounds. 
So, so you were a skeleton, basically. A skeleton with skin hanging off of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and my esophagus finally healed, and I started eating oysters. <laughs> I eat oysters three times a day because it was the only thing that would go down. Mm-hmm. Um, and all was good. They restarted all the other radiation and chemo. And uh, in December of 2016, late December, right before Christmas, they told me the good news was is that the big monster in my lower left lung was completely gone. But the bad news is, is that it had metastasized from head to toe. I had my PET scan looked like a Christmas tree. And I don't know how many people know about there, but only second to fourth stage pancreatic, but once you have small cell widely metastasized, you're a goner. Zero zero percent chance of survival and a median life expectancy of three to six months. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's what the guy told me. Uh, Three to six months and there's really nothing we can do. Um, And um, the next day, and they basically told me to get my affairs in order plan hospice and all of that, those ugly things. And the next day, I get the wildest phone call from a large animal veterinarian in Western Oklahoma. He's now passed away from congenital heart failure. Um, And he told me this story about a lady scientist at Merck on the veterinary side of Merck who had implanted cancer in stomach, brains, liver, pancreas, all different body parts in Uh, hundreds of mice and she was doing cancer research uh, on the the veterinary side and her entire mouse population came down with intestinal parasites if you went out to any zoo in the world there would be a pile of fenbendazole head high they'd bring in by the front end loader side the whole truckload size because every zoo gives this drug to every animal in the animal kingdom from a tiny little bird all the way up to the elephant. Wow. Oh. And so she gave her entire mouse population. She was trying to save all of her research. So she gave her entire mouse population fenbendazole. And, you know, a few weeks later, she came back and accidentally found out that she'd also cured the cancer that she'd implanted. Well, as unluck would have it or luck for me anyway, um, she then came down with four stage glioblastoma wrapped around her brain stem and was told there was nothing they could do. You know, same, same message, mm-hmm. go home and get your affairs in order. Think about hospice, hospice. And she cured herself of four stage glioblastoma with bendendus. Oh my goodness. And so I was told that story literally 24 hours after I was told to go home and die. And I decided, what the heck, I got nothing to lose. Um, so I started taking it along with a few other things. I, I, I'm a voracious researcher and I was constantly researching. And I have to maybe stop here and interject that um, I can't explain why, but when I was told to go home and die, it didn't phase me. I was 100% positive that I would figure out a way to, to lick it. And I learned after the journey that there's a scientist at Stanford named Bruce Lipton who has actually connected the dots scientifically between positive thinking and what, and what happens literally at the cellular level. Absolutely. Well, I don't, uh, I, I can't tell you how much. I believe some percentage of my success was the fact that I was just absolutely positive. I would figure out mm-hmm. it, 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 who knows. No, I I think so, Joe. Uh, There are so many good studies now, even more and more coming out that um, just that positive attitude and and getting your your brain into that highway that your your immune cells actually react. They can, you know, they can look at brain scans and functional MRIs to verify that. And so I think that's a, it's really great that you brought that out. Um, I would, I would recommend everybody. He has many lectures out on YouTube and all different links, but there is a two and a half hour one that if anybody can take two and a half hours out of their time, even if you split it up in two or three spots and it's called the biology of belief by, yes. by, by Bruce Lipton. And I, I highly recommend people go watch that video because I didn't know about it and see it until after I was in remission. But then I had to look back and go, holy cow, 
how much of my success was actually because I was always positive. I don't know. Well, it's never one thing. And we'll put the link to uh, Dr. Lipton's book in our show notes for everybody, uh, as well as that YouTube. I've I've never even read the book. I just watch his lectures. Um, Yeah. Anyway, um, I started taking it. I didn't tell anybody at MD Anderson why and what. And, you know, along the way, they put me on an uh, immunotherapy clinical trial. And I really didn't want to get kicked off of the trial. I was being selfish. And so I didn't tell anybody that, what I was taking. And um, uh, then in first week of May of 2017, I miraculously turned up NED, no evidence of disease. And in the 45-year history of MD Anderson, I'm pretty much the sole data outlier of, mm-hmm. with, with widely metastasized small cell lung cancer uh, actually living. Well, I would want the listeners to know there's nothing selfish about you. Uh, (laughs) This has radically changed your life, taken over your life. You've invested your own money in auditing these cases. Um, So uh, you're going to tell us more about that. So There's two questions people might ask. Uh, When I went from 220 pounds down to 108 pounds in an unintentional, it was an intentional fast, uh, but kind of unintentional why. Um, and so people say, well, you know, fasting helps cancer. Was it, is it possible that your fasting is, is what saved you? And the answer is absolutely not because my wide metastasis happened after the fasting. Right. And then the second thing people say is, well, how do you know it wasn't the uh, immunotherapy clinical trial drug that you were on? And I say, well, I've got pretty good evidence that's not the case because this immuno drug is pretty successful for other types of cancer, but it has never been successful for widely, widely metastasized small cell lung cancer. Mm-hmm. And the trial I was on was specifically widely metastasized small cell lung cancer, and I'm the only survivor of the trial. Right. So. I don't think it was the immunotherapy or it would have saved other people in the trial other than me. Mm -hmm. Um, So I I can kind of lay to rest that it wasn't the finbendazole. You know, it it, it really, it truly was. Mm -hmm. And the long journey I've taken with scientists and oncologists all over the globe is it started in 2017 of, you know, that guy's batshit crazy and he's a wacko. Don't listen to him to here six years later, most of them, most people, and they can't uh, prescribe it because it's not human approved. So it's illegal for them to say, do it. But now most oncologists, a majority of oncologists Mm -hmm. I've educated. And they they say, well, I can't tell you to do that, winky, winky, but you you know, it won't hurt you. (laughs) Right. Mm -hmm. And so rule number one of medicine is don't make something worse. You know, and and um, I can assure people out there that this protocol I've developed over a six year period, it's not going to make it worse. It's, it, the downside risk is virtually zero. And there is now thousands of success stories mm-hmm. other than me, yes. um, as evidence that there is upside here. So I went from uh, NED in May of 17 again in I did two PET scans in month to month, back to back, because one was my regular scheduled PET scan, and then another one was to end the clinical trial. <laughs> and I remained uh, NED. I was doing PET scans every three months. Well, and, and Joe, oh, excuse me. Uh, but you know, the a rule of medicine is not to make anything worse, but another rule of medicine is patient autonomy, and mm-hmm. which just means you're the boss of you. And mm-hmm. I think that's so good for people to remember you uh, epitomize this. I mean, you, you still well, listen to your doctors and had a relationship there, I but caused, you took yeah, control. Caused, because of that, I caused some problems along the way. Um, so when they ended the clinical trial and I knew I couldn't get kicked off of the clinical trial, I then fessed up to what I had been taking. And that set off a whole domino effect of other downstream problems because because at the end of the day, I was the only survivor of the of the trial. 
And because I admitted I was taking something else along the way, they had to throw the entire trial out. Oh, my. Oh, I never they thought about that. They couldn't use me as a success in the trial because I was taking something else that now likely was the real reason I, I was saved. Uh -huh. And that, they weren't happy with me. And I had a meeting with the with the Merck uh, exec that was doing the trial. And I said, you know, you guys uh, are in the vet med business and in your new human business. I recommend you get your animal people with your human people. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, and you know, these rat people make study, uh, make fun of these mouse studies and rat studies, but they can lead to great things. It's right. just, it's incredible. So anyway, I, uh, my, because I do business in Asia and Europe and North America without anything, just, talking to friends and family and business associates around the world, my story went viral without any marketing and or, or digital digitization. And I started receiving hundreds of phone calls a week um, in early 2018. And um, I honestly didn't start this journey for anything other reason about, again, selfishness, I was naive about um, social media and the power of social media in the digital digital world. Even though I'm in the VC business and I've invested in that stuff, I really did have never done a deep dive. And I naively thought if I wrote a blog, people would leave me alone. <laughs> you can go about your life. Yeah. Um, so I wrote the blog hoping people would read it instead of call me. And that just made it worse. The blog almost immediately went viral all over the world. I mean, within uh, literally within 60 days of writing the blog and posting it, I was in 96 countries. Oh, my uh, goodness. And hope, hope and inspiration are, um, you yeah, know, pretty good marketers, viral. right? Yes. Right. Right. And it went crazy. I mean, I literally was uh, seeing traffic on the blog of, 50,000 a month, 100,000 a month, 300,000 a month, 500,000 a month. And seeing the traffic all over uh, by country all over the world was, you know, I had, I really joked about this. I had 150 hits inside of Vatican City. Oh my goodness. And so that's I'm thinking, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. That's too oh. bad. Too bad St. Joe's already been taken. <laughs> oh my goodness. That is hilarious because you can tell exactly where they're coming from. Oh, right. Where were they coming yes. from? So um, yeah, it went crazy. Um, and I I got up to over, uh, I think over a million hits. Um, and then I started the, because I, people were still calling me and still bugging me. Um, and I, I've got a real job. Uh, I thought, well, if I start a Facebook group and get some volunteers to moderate it, then that'll be the play, the forum where everybody will discuss this right. and, not, and leave me alone. Mm -hmm. And we did. And I made it very clear. Um, this is crazy. I asked for global volunteers to cover every time zone in the world. And immediately had wow. dozens and dozens of people volunteering to to be moderators. Wow, and, I, and I'm so thankful for those people because they spend a lot of time. Anytime you do something on something like Facebook, you're going to have thousands of charlatans and multi-level marketers and bullshitters and crazy people try to join the, the discussion. And you got to try your best to keep that out. Mm -hmm. So I instigated a control where uh, I embed passwords in the blog and if you haven't read the blog you won't know the password and so the rule to join our web our facebook group was um you have to be a care a direct cancer patient or a direct caregiver you have to prove that you've read the blog in its entirety and then you have to answer a few other questions and if you don't do all of that you're not admitted to the group and so we're up to, I think, 40,000 in the group today. And I think over 150,000 have attempted to join. Um, so uh, we keep it very tight. And, and, and the discussion is kept tight around yeah. my protocol only. Uh, 
So along the way, I started getting success cases in other than me, and they're all anecdotal. They were, he said, she said, you have to believe these people are telling the truth. How do we know that they are actually uh, success cases with my protocol? And so I got the bright idea of uh, getting Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation, which is a, unknown to most people outside of Oklahoma, but it's very large. They have 400 PhDs. Um, and I've got a, a local uh, oil and gas billionaire to fund OMRF and starting to audit our success cases. Well, along the way, um, a lady scientist, uh, she's a clinician, PhD and MD in uh, cervical and ovarian cancer. Um, and she had three miraculous recoveries in one month period that were unexplainable. She brought everybody in to interview them and find out what, what's going on. And all three of them said, well, I'm on the Joe Tippins protocol. Oh, and, <laughs> so, she called, so she called OMRF and joined the effort. And then something very similar happened at the University of Washington in Seattle. And they called OMR up and joined the effort. And then um, along the way, I got to know the president uh, and chief medical officer of Emory University Medical School, and he joined the effort. And so uh, all of went went from, you know, a bunch of anecdotal he said, she says to, holy crap, these, these people are, they got dug into their medical files and they talked to the doctors and did everything and they come out and... And for the first time ever in early 2022, March-ish, uh, Stanford and Washington actually re uh, published a research paper uh, auditing success cases. Um, and so it's no longer anecdotal. Uh, it's, it's real, right? Right. Well, and as a venture capitalist, you've uh, embarked on the most incredible adventure that you probably you could um, never imagine. It's, it's just, it's just wonderful. Uh, you were generous enough to come to our study club and you talked about three succinct pathways by which Ben Benzidol actually works. Could you tell our listeners about those? Sure. Um, well, you know, there has to be some way that it work. It's working and it has to be some way that it seems to be cancer agnostic or cancer subtype agnostic. And so, uh, thankfully, there were three PhD scientists, two of them which have now retired, unfortunately, uh, three PhD scientists in India, uh, whose life work, believe it or not, was on fenbendazole on cancer. And they had proven scientifically the three pathways by which finben is, is actually working. And first is, uh, in the inside of a cancer cell wall, there is microtubules. If you think of a pillar holding a wall up, you think of a microtubule holding the cancer cell wall up. And this is a really layman's description. It's not quite this. Love it. This is this yeah. is vitality made simple, Joe. Thank you. <laughs> and they proved that. And, and by the way, those microtubules are not only necessary for the cell wall structure of a cancer cell, but they are also absolutely the key to the cell being able to divide and multiply. And two becomes four, becomes eight, becomes 16, et cetera. And they have proven scientifically that fenbendazole is knocking out those uh, microtubules, uh, destroying the cancer cell's ability to replicate. And why is that? And it's just one of these lucky serendipitous things that have happened in nature. Uh, this drug was invented to kill intestinal parasites, and it just so happens that intestinal parasites have a similar cell structure oh. uh, to a cancer cell in terms of the microtubule. Um, and so it was really just quite luck. Um, and the second pathway that it works with is everybody knows, I think everybody knows that cancer can't survive without sugar. It has a voracious appetite for sucrose. And they've proven that this finbendazole is interrupting the cancer cell's ability to metabolize sucrose. And the third one, which I really think is the most fascinating, is everybody out there listening or watching that is cancer-free is 
for a reason. You have a very healthy level of P53, which is the cancer killing gene. And P53 is floating through your body 24 seven and you, you have cancer foot cells being generated in your body 24 seven, 365. And you just happen to have the right level of P53 that's going in and killing that. Uh, and so that can never, it can never metastasize. And those of us that get cancer, and this again is very layman's uh, way of describing it, eat one of two things is really happening. Either your P53 is mutated to the point where it cannot kill cancer anymore, or for some ungodly reason, your titer level or your level of P53 is just reduced to a level that it can't kill cancer anymore. And the PhD scientists in India have proven that for whatever reason, uh, they didn't get to continue the reach research to find out why, but they have proven that it's true that finbendazole is producing new healthy P53 uh, oh, in, your, in your body, which is one of the reasons I actually re recommend this as a preventative measure for people. Mm -hmm. um, because if you got, if you're stimulating P53 constantly, you're never going to get metastasis, right? Right. So, no. Well, and that, thanks to you. Uh, I'm now doing it three times a week after uh, meeting you at the functional medicine study club. You know, I have that crazy diagnosis of CLL um, subclinically and I feel fine, but I just, you know, every time I, I put it in my yogurt three days a week and just <laughs> and think positively, like you said, and just know I'm going to be fine. So yeah. thank you for that. Um, now tell us about the wild experience that happened with um, your blog getting translated into yeah. Chinese. Well, I've got two Asian stories, one very good and one very bad. The very bad one is, and I, I cannot explain even how, when, why, but my story went viral in Korea, and the Korean government was not happy. They wanted to stop it. Um, and there were literally tens of thousands of people in, in Korea taking it, and on the auspices of uh, positively telling my story to the Korean public, they sent a uh, marketing videographer uh, guy from Seoul, Korea to Oklahoma City to my house. And they billed it as they were going to, you know, really talk up and talk the story positively. But they had bad intentions from the start. They uh, just basically did a complete hit piece on me and oh told the entire, and told the entire country of Korea that don't take this stuff, blah, blah, blah. It was really crazy. Um, and then on the positive side, uh, this one's really funny because uh, I didn't even know that this was already globally called the Joe Tippins Protocol. I had no idea. Um I've heard some people in in the Facebook group re refer to it as that, but it, it was not, I didn't think it was widespread. So I got a call, it was only four months ago. Um, and I don't answer unknown calls um, because I get so many, I just can't. It, 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 I tell people, if you're a family friend or a, there's a connection, you know, text me first, tell me the connection and I'll call, talk to all you back. But, I still get hundreds and hundreds of phone calls and I don't have time to answer all of them. But this call came in with a China country code. And I was curious about a China curious. country. Curious. We love so, your curiosity, Joe. So, Thank so you. I so I answered the phone. And the guy with a perfect Queen's British accent, um evidently he was educated in Hong Kong. Uh, he uh called and said, my bosses wanted me to call you. And I said, well, who are you and who are your bosses? And he goes, well, I'm the editor in chief of the Beijing news. And my jaw dropped. <laughs> and I said, well, then your, your bosses are the, are the Chinese government. And he goes, y yes, sir. <laughs> I said, well, why are you calling me? And he said, well, do you realize that you are a rock star in China? And I, I said, what? What are you talking about? I had no idea any of this was going on. And he said, well, a PhD uh, medical student in Arizona State University from China uh, 
translated your blog into two different Chinese dialects and posted two different websites on China. And there's over 10 million views in those two websites in China alone. And we happen to believe that there's over 50,000 people on the Joe Tippins. No, no it even gets better. No, it wasn't the Joe Tippins protocol. On the Uncle Joey <laughs> protocol. And I said, what in the hell? <laughs> That's Uncle, so Uncle, rich. Uncle, Uncle Joey protocol and 100,000 people are taking it in China. <laughs> what the hell are you talking about? He said, well, we were curious about that as too, Joe, and it's quite funny, but we've located where the Uncle Joey comes from, and your niece, Casey, which is my brother Doug's daughter, had posted to something on Facebook that uh, to, referring to me as Uncle Joey. Oh, that's and, so great. And, and the Chinese people thought that Uncle Joe, Uncle was a term of endearment, right? And, and so, it is. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> so I'm now Uncle Joey all over China. I love and, that. And, and the protocol is called the Uncle Joey protocol. Oh, that <laughs> you can't make this kind of stuff up. This is so fantastic. So I uh, I then I then asked the guy a question, and and I just did a follow up uh, ping to him last week. So I said, let me ask a crazy question, and he said, what's that? And I said. China doesn't have HIPAA laws like we have here in terms of medical secrecy of your own medical account. I don't think the Chinese government really gives a crap about people's personal medical history. Would it be possible for the Chinese government to go in and audit those 50,000 cases? It could be the largest clinical trial in the oh, history of the world. He said, that's actually, my mind. he said, that's actually a really good idea um, because we can't fund a clinical trial here in the United States, and here's why. It's a 20-year off-patent drug that mm -hmm. even, if, even if FDA approved would uh, have generic competition the next mm -hmm. day. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to spend $300 million to do a new clinical trial only to have generic competition the next day. It's just the economics aren't there and it'll never happen. Although I believe the one benefactor that should do it is the United States government because our cancer expenditure for Medicare alone is enormous. And there's a there would be a payback for the United States government to actually do the clinical mm -hmm. trial, not for profit, right? Um, but I don't think we'll convince anybody to do that. Um, so he said that was a good idea and he was going to check with his bosses and see if they could do something about that. So we'll see. Um, oh, so that's still in the we'll see phase. Oh yeah, my goodness. Yeah, yeah they it's going to happen. They're not, yeah, they're not doing anything yet, but uh, they're, oh. they're contemplating it. Um, yeah. Well, it takes so long to set up and, and it reminds me, the story reminds me of, uh, you had quoted a Goldman Sachs article, um, when I heard you speak about the, um, oh, it's kind of like the, it's not a sustainable model. To yeah. Curing cancer, curing cancer is not a sustainable business model. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Crazy. <laughs> Crazy. Well, and after hearing you, I went and looked up that article and it, it was just, it's sort of chilling because it also talked about how they didn't want to cure like hep hepatitis C because not only would they lose the revenue, but they would also, um, there wouldn't be as many people uh, transmitting hep C. I mean, it was just, yeah. it was just unbelievable as a, you know. A mm -hmm. healthcare practitioner trying to help people get well to hear, to think that other people even have that attitude and i'm sure you've been shocked many times in yeah, your so, journey well i'm i'm shocked mostly by the new success cases that come in almost every week and i spend 30 to 40 hours a week on this and I, it's oh. pro bono i don't make any money off of this right um but almost every week somebody reaches out to me and quote unquote says you saved my life uh, and so you don't need a lot of compensation financially because right. that's that's pretty healthy compensation just the feeling that you get when somebody says that and some really couple funny stories i was in a in fact these two happened back to back in successive weeks i was in an irish pub in zurich switzerland my business is half based in zurich um, 
I was in an Irish pub, kind of one of those famous bars where everybody knows your name. <laughs> and a female bartender, probably in her mid-20s, said, are you Joe Tippins? And I it shocked me because I guess since there's uh, video blogs like this mm -hmm. we're doing right now or get posted and people actually then see my face, they recognize me. And I said, well, yes, I am. Why are you asking? And she, she literally got up on this chair and she yelled for the whole bar to shut up. And the whole bar got quiet. And she goes, this man saved my mother's life. Oh. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. Right. Wow. Well, 30 minutes later, mom came into the bar with her cell phone for hugs and selfies. And, and the oh rest my gosh. And the following week in London, the exact same thing happened in a, a very upscale hotel bar in a, in London, an identical story. And um, so it happens to me literally once or twice a week now, even oh. with just traveling world, what, what I do. Um, and I think the coolest thing is uh, I wish I'd have had the time to build a, a very quality, well-structured database because I've just been it been inundated with success stories coming in over the transom, both people reaching out to me directly or through the Facebook group or at, on, directly on the blog itself. And I'm, I know we're well over a thousand success cases of all different kinds of cancer subtypes all over the world. Um, and, uh, but it's, the, the problem is, I don't know, I, I, I happen to believe there's probably 10x that that I don't know about. And I don't know the failures. Uh, and and I, so I don't know the denominator. Um, and so there's no way to do a clinical trial type database because uh, I don't know all the information. However, I pretty much can tell you that when people proactively report failures where this did not work for their loved one. 90% um, of those were so skeptical that they just waited until it was too late uh, to, to start. When I was just over in Switzerland two weeks ago, three weeks ago, and my partner asked me to sit down with a, a family uh, in their village. And they had a uh, eight-year-old boy who the doctors had said there's nothing else we can do um and uh he had a really high pressure tumor in his brain that was that, that they, there's nothing they could do with and i said look it may it may be too late he was literally on his deathbed but why not try it you know if it, i'm not a doctor i'm not a scientist and i shouldn't be even tell telling a couple like you this but what I can tell you is if it was my eight-year-old son, I would try it, right? Absolutely. Well, they didn't even get started on it, and he passed away the next day. Oh. Yeah, so, um, it, uh, and I have a lot of stories like that where people, um, you can imagine why people are skeptical. You know, it's, uh, you know, it, are you kidding me? It's a veterinary drug for dogs, and I'm just going to cure me, and it, it, it if I didn't live the story, I probably wouldn't be a believer, <laughs> you know? Well, but, but yeah. you know, so many things are uh, the same across different species. And, you know, we're not skeptical of some of these high powered radiation treatments, chemotherapy treatments, yeah. surgical interventions that, um, that leave people sicker. I mean, I think you... Yep. Uh, said in the lecture I heard uh, from you that the only time you were sick was when you were undergoing um, those treatments doesn't yeah. mean we don't do those treatments. This is, to me, this is the epitome of integrative medical care, which is the best of all worlds. And, and Joe, there's no telling how many people you've saved from getting cancer. I mean, lots of people uh, as a fellow Oklahoman that I know are using your protocol as a prevention. And of course that can never be measured, but it's certainly real. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm sure there are some, um, but you, there's no way of knowing, you know? So uh, what we, in this six year journey, what I can honestly say to anybody is 
I now have hundreds of thousands of people have taken this. Not, I mean, how many clinical trials involve hundreds of thousands of right. people? Um, and we now know for sure that with a couple of minor exceptions, uh, 98, and those probably less than 2% of the population, um, the downside risk is virtually zero. Mm -hmm. And with thousands of success cases coming in over the transom, we also know that there is upside uh, and there's benefit. So in any business in, in the world, if you have zero downside and you have knowledge of upside, then the only question you really should ask is why not? Right. right. Well, as a venture capitalist, nobody knows that better than you. When you think about risk versus return, it's yes. kind of duh, you know, I really. Yeah, I don't ever get the chance to look, do anything without risk. Mm -hmm. never, right. Never. never. <laughs> you uh. know? So, yeah. So it's now the question is, where do we go from here and what do I do, do from here? I'm really at a loss. I don't know. Um, the, the blog continues to grow. Um, the number of people becoming believers continues to grow. And the, more importantly, the success cases keep coming in weekly and that keeps growing. So, um, I, you know, I, I get a huge chill. Go, chills go all over my body when somebody calls me and tells me I saved their life. Oh my goodness. You know, that's oh. crazy. How do you get that chance to do that in any life, right? Oh, to the purpose you're living is so yeah. impressive. And and it's your generosity. I mean, whenever I contacted you for this podcast, you didn't say, you know, how many listeners, how many countries, how many downloads. You you just said yes. Yeah. And I can't thank you yeah. enough. And then we well, this and is then, a this a forum like this is way better for me than trying to field a thousand phone calls. Right. Um and so it, it comes back to I have to keep I have to keep control of my time. I mean, I'm flunking retirement, and uh, <laughs> you're and living the life that's true to life, Joe. You extremely are extremely busy, and I love I love what I do, so it's really not like work. Um, but th there should be an efficient way of getting this out. It, in a perfect world, I could have a meeting with the head of department of. Uh, health, health and, and health and services in the United States government, and give them the data of how much worse our Medicare is spending on cancer deaths, yeah. um, and um, Medicare hospice, mm -hmm. and you take total it all up, and we're spending billions and billions and billions and billions on cancer for the post sixty five crowd. Yeah. And if anybody could benefit from a, a, a clinical trial uh, to get this human approved, it would be them. And I'm trying to get that audience. I haven't been successful yet. Um, I'm not well, sure they will hear it. Well, this grassroots um, work that you're doing is so important. And I really appreciate you spending time uh, with us here on Vitality Made Simple, we we have uh, qu quite a community developing, and uh, this will be on the pod all podcast platforms as well as on YouTube. I, I just can't thank you enough, Joe, and thanks for giving me a second chance. You know, we flubbed <laughs> up so bad on technology, but but Joe's patient. He's he's uh, he was curious to see if we would figure it out. <laughs> I appreciate <laughs> that curiosity again. So just well, thank I, you I, so I, much. I, I'm so proud to be. Um, a fellow Oklahoman with you and, and I just wish you the utmost blessings from what you're doing and um, just keep doing it. And I, I listeners, thank you for joining us for episode 92 of Vitality Made Simple. It's because of you that this podcast is spreading. I am a social media introvert. And um, so please keep sharing, please keep subscribing, and please keep listening. Share this episode with Mr. Joe Tippins with anybody it can help his his mantra has been if this helps one person it's worth it so thank you again for your time joe it's just been a total pleasure to spend time with you oh, you're welcome thank you thank you bye-bye